Good morning. Everything worked an hour ago, so <laughs> I, I think we've got it all worked out now. Yeah. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Bucket Courses, the perfect place to be on a Wednesday morning in Grinnell, Iowa. We're very happy to see all of you. My name is Barb Lease, and uh, here's some things you need to know before we start. Please turn off your cell phones or silence them. Turn on your T-coil if you have one. If there's time for questions, Heidi and I will come around with the mics. Please speak directly into the mic. And if you're able, after the program's over, you can help put your chair up. There's dollies at the front and the back. Okay, now for the main event. I am delighted to have a second opportunity to introduce today's speaker. Most of you in this room know Dr. J.R. Paulson, who recently retired as a family practitioner after 42 years of serving our Grinnell community. Not only as a family doctor, but also for most of that time as hospice medical director. He's the founder of the Grinnell Area Mental Health Consortium, JPK, which promotes access to mental health care for all. Two weeks ago, we learned about the dangers of BS and how to recognize it. And today's lecture is entitled, BS and How to Avoid Stepping in It. <laughs> Please join me once again in welcoming Dr. J.R. Paulson. Uh. Get the front lights, just one front light down. Can you hear me in the back there? Great. Okay, well, I'm happy to be here. Get rocking and rolling. Uh, I added the, in dealing with others who have stepped in it, I think that's important. So after the break, I, I want to go over how we deal with others who have stepped in it. I asked my cat what he thinks about this. So Junior said, it's so exhausting dealing with people's bullshit. So part two, danger zones of high BS, common traps and errors in detecting it. I want to give you an algorithm for dealing with others uh, who you are sure have stepped in it. We'll talk a little about BS and AI and some concluding remarks. So that's the plan. Danger zone, cow and bull pastures. Don't be wandering around in a cow pasture, particularly at night. <laughs> We're going to talk about marketing, all types. We're going to give a couple examples. Uh, politics, of course, loaded with BS. Religion, you probably didn't want to see that on there, but it's on there, folks. Social media, childhood and aces. I have some good quotes along the way. This is one that I really like that hopefully you'll memorize. When you want to help people, you tell them the truth. When you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. How true is that? So, marketing, BS, wine and movie ratings. Those are the two examples. Example, pretend you have folks over, say, for dinner, just like us, to sit around and chat. We're not very wine knowledgeable and wonder which one to buy. We decide on a Cabernet Sauvignon and go to the store. At McNally's, you see shelves and shelves of them. Which one to pick? You may Google this varietal on your smartphone and see what the experts say, which ones have won medals or awards. Then you price them, you see what the price range is. And I did this at McNally's, $6.99 and up to $77.99 a bottle. Little difference. Which one to choose? Of course, you want to impress your guests with your wine savvy. Well, that's BS right there. <laughs> So I feel like most of us, you fall victim to two framing biases. You assume the more expensive one is the better because it costs more. You assume the one with more medals or awards is better because experts have judged them and found them so. You might even have checked the vintage year and assumed that an older wine is better. But both of these were around 2020. So this is a yellow tail for $6.99 a bottle. And this is an Oren Swift Palmero at $77.99 a bottle. Ten times more. Which one to buy? 
Well, what do the experts think? And of course, their job is to go and test all these wines all over. But what's the real story of wine testing? A retired statistics professor, get that, he's a statistics professor, and he's owned a winery in Northern California for 35 years. So he did a study showing that wine judges at the California State Fair gave dramatically different scores to the same wine when tasting it blind on two different occasions. The study has popped back into the mainstream media this year, cited as proof that wine tasting is junk science or, what's that word? Bullshit. So this interview asked the, the wine guy, Hodges, what he really thought about it. Well, he said the second paper he wrote had to do with tracking wine through U.S. competitions, not just California. 99% of the wines that get gold medals in one place get no awards someplace else. Several gold medal wines were entered in five, com five competitions. None of them got five golds. None of them got four golds. It's amazing the lack of consistency. I put together a study that showed that these are the results you would get if this were a completely random process. I'm not willing to bite the bullet and say it's completely random. I don't think that's true, but that's what the results indicate. One winery entered 14 competitions. It got no awards in 13 of them. And they got a gold medal in the 14th. Guess what label is on the bottle? Gold medal winner. In one of Hodgson's experiments, he blindfolded wine experts and offered them three glasses of wine to taste. Then they graded them. The judge's rating of the wine varied by over four points. However, all three glasses were from the same bottle. <laughs> Brochet had 54. That's a pretty good sample. Wine experts report their opinions on two glasses of wine, one red and the other white. Experts describe the red wines in terms typically reserved for characterizing red wines, such as jammy or containing flavors imparted by its crushed red fruit. The catch, the red wine had been dyed with food coloring. <laughs> Not one of the 54 experts detected that the red wine was in fact a white. In another study, MIT behavioral economists looked at the relationship between wine reviews and the price of wines. She did 3,000 different wines, price ranging from five to 200. She found that the jargon describing them varied significantly. For the cheap wines, had tasty, juicy, fruity, and went well with chicken and pizza. And some of the other more expensive wines, chocolate, supple, elegant, cuvee, impaired with shellfish and chateaubriand steak. Confirmed BS, I think, but probably not harmful. Only to your wallet or purse. Wine selling is a big business. United States market, $70 billion. Global market, $350 billion. My conclusions are that I don't have to feel guilty for drinking or serving cheaper wines, and that I will continue to drink what I like. Okay, our friends, after a nice dinner with wine, want to see a movie. We see what's playing down at the Strand, and it's the Jesus Revolution, uh, Oppenheimer and Sharknado 1. Not being familiar with them, we agreed to look online for the reviews. Do we just trust the ratings or factor in our own likes and dislikes? Sharknado. Reviews. Uh, he scores 1.5 out of 5. Rotten Tomatoes said, yeah, it's so bad, it's actually good. So you look at the reviews and you see the audience summary. Geez, quite a few people liked it. And, but notice down at the bottom, a whole bunch of people didn't like it. <laughs> so it scores 3.7 out of 5. Jesus Revolution, okay. First review from The Guardian. It leaves out huge chunks of irrelevant data and is essentially propaganda. It's not a very favorable review. Audience reviews, this is one of my favorite faith-based films I've ever seen. It's incredible. So audience summary, wow. Five. Look at all the fives. He gets 4.8. And uh, number one down on the bottom, hardly anybody didn't like it. And I went online one time and looked and 95% people liked it. And Oppenheimer. Reviews. Rotten Tomatoes gave it 93. Audience rating 3.6. It's a long movie. Uh, about three hours. It's going to uh, uh, appeal to a certain 
uh, type person. Notice the varying in reviews. So which one to see? Within our group, one's a big Sharknado fan and has seen all six. <laughs> one of our guests is a Muslim and another an avowed atheist. One has just finished the long book, American Prometheus. Do we go by the opinion of the expert reviewers, the audience ratings who liked it, or go by our preferences? We decided the two of us would see Oppenheimer, four would play bridge, and two would watch football. <laughs> so on reviews, I think Consumer Reports is probably pretty legitimate, or another one some people think you're even better called Decide. Uh, I copied this, and if you watch TV, you'll see they've seen this ad lately. Omega XL, joint and muscle support. Gee, it's from the green-tipped muscle oil extracted from the pristine waters of New Zealand. Wow, that there makes it pretty good. Oh, so who's promoting it? John Walsh. Remember him? Famous actor and producer, most noted for Americans, America's Most Wanted, Wrongfully Accused, and The Fugitive. And he's a truth detector, so you got to believe him. And of course, they have to have a slide with some pretty cool women looking in there pushing it. Again, marketing. I say, oh, that was uh, 39 40 bucks. I like this one better. Snake oil. Dr. Jake Dawson's snake oil. And gee, it's made from the oil of the Chinese water snake, which is rich in omega-3 acids that help reduce inflammation. 30 cents a bottle. So I'm going for the snake oil on this one. Prevagen. Can't watch any TV. If you do, we don't watch much, but without seeing the prev Prevagen for your brain. I asked my cat, what do you think? <laughs> and Junior said, looks like bullshit from this angle, too. My cats are pretty smart. Now, on all of those ads for TV, uh, for the supplements, it said, this statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. The product is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure, any, or prevent any illness. And I go, read that again, please. <laughs> it's not intended to treat any illness? Yeah, but it goes on the screen one second, I timed that, and in tiny print. So, yeah, they got their disclaimer on there, but that's what it says. Harvard Health Letter. Eh, don't waste your time or money on dietary supplements. This is in April 22. We're spending almost $36 billion on these. A lot of money. There's no real proven stuff on it. Well, I give this a two-fly rating. It should be one but two because a lot of people have real serious medical conditions that they take this stuff and delay their diagnosis. Where if they went and you got a real diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you want to hop on that rather than take your Prevagen for a year or two and find out eh, it's not working too well. Anyone take Latin? Raise your hand in here. All right. I, this is a very select audience. This is one of the first terms I learned in eighth grade Latin. Caveat emptor. Of course, what does it mean? It's a Latin phrase, let the buyer beware means that an individual buys at their own risk. Potential buyers are warned by the phrase to do their own research and ask pointed questions of the seller. Seller isn't responsible for problems that the buyer encounters with the product after the sale, right? It's also legally used in contracts, and it's called due diligence. So you sold this property and you found out there was an underground stream under it, hey, that's your problem. Uh, and in Rome, it was a law on the books in Rome, caveat emptor. You know, they had it right on their, their legal books. Selling swamp land in Florida. Who's going to buy swamp land in Florida? Who's dumb enough to do that? Uh, the swamp peddlers. Well, guess what? How about buying land in Arkansas? Linda and I fell for this scam. Uh, when we were young, in our younger days, we saw this investment in Arkansas land that over... 30 years would turn into this great lake property and be worth 10 times what we put into it. So at that time, uh, being poor, we put our, I think, $52 a month into this property. Of course, then 20 years later, you find out the place has gone bankrupt. It's worth almost nothing. Not swampland in Florida. And we went to Arkansas and actually looked at, at, at the place. So, But we did not do enough due diligence. I put this in because it's another BS booby trap. AD detection, a blood test for Alzheimer's, and the date on this is October 13th of this month, folks. 
So now you'll see advertisements so you can get blood tests done and tests that you can mail in to test you for Alzheimer's. Very dangerous, shouldn't be out there. Interpretation, how good is the test? So okay. what about prescription drugs? Aren't they FDA approved and tested? Different. Many of you, again, if you watch any TV, achieve clear skin, oh, Tesla. Amgen runs light-hard Tesla ad as Soraya's market heats up. They know this is a big market. Any side effects? Do you listen to the side effects? Can you hear them clearly? I don't know about you, but they say, and it could cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, depression, and may weaken your immune system and cause hepatitis, and certain cancers have been reported, and the commercial fades out, right? Remember the framing bias from the first lecture? Products, procedures, and drugs can be framed in different ways. If you are marketing something, you play this to your audience. Do you emphasize the potential risks or the potential benefits? Most people would like to look better and downplay or ignore the potential risks. Is the cost of the drug a side effect? Maybe. Oh, it's $4,600 a month. Uh, that could be an issue. But good news, folks. You can get it from Canada for only $1,500 a month. So what do you think about the TV advertising uh, to you? The U.S. and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that allow direct-to-consumer prescription drug advertising. Between 96 and 220, you can see how much money was spent on it. A half a billion on advertising in the left in 96. In 2020, 10 times more, over 6 billion in TV advertising. Well, what does that reflect? Look on the right side. How much did we pay, pay at the pharmacy? This in 96, 1 121 billion. How much now are we paying for drugs? Over 406 billion. So their advertising pays off at the counter. As a physician, I have many objections to TV advertising. A major one is that it promotes that there's a pill for every malady from fatigue, insomnia, weight loss, memory, attention deficit to depression, and whatever else ails you. No need to examine other causes, lifestyle changes, or side effects. Suggests that there's a quick fix without much effort needed for all our medical problems, both real and perceived. Disclaimer, I'm not a complete pharmacologic nihilist and have prescribed. Gee, I'm not sure how effective this drug is, but it's got a pretty catchy commercial. <laughs> Do doctors fall victim to BS? Yes, of course, even though we think we should know better. We are human after all and susceptible to all the cognitive biases uh, like everybody else. Example, where do most physicians get their drug information from? Big pharma salesmen, folks. However, that's a misnomer because they're not men usually. Right, uh, DF in the back. <laughs> uh, yeah, people are like this. <laughs> you saw the change. They realized doctors are more influenced by remember those women standing up next to the commercial stuff on TV. Yep. How do drug reps influence doctors? The pharmaceutical representatives seek to change the prescribing habits of physicians, and they're very effective. Industry survey found that more than half of high prescribing doctors cited drug reps as their main source of information about new drugs. Another three quarters said that they thought it was very useful or somewhat useful. How many doctors get kickbacks from drug companies? More than 600,000. This is scary to me. I didn't realize it was so much. So here's the way back when. Here's all the drug companies. And how many doctors, that's not money, how many doctors they paid money on the side to? Drug companies hire troubled doctors as experts. Doctors have been in trouble. So this is who the drug companies often, not always, hire to promote their drugs. When I go to Mayo Clinic for many, many years of lectures and somebody gets up there to talk, now they put a first slide they put on. Disclosures, I'm working for Pfizer. I'm working for AstraZeneca. We want to know that as doc. We want to know, is there a conflict of interest here? Are you getting any, any bucks on the side for what you're going to tell us about this drug? It always used to be that way, but now we always have to do disclosures. 
So where do doctors want to get their drugs? Well, information, 35% from live drug reps. 11.7 for conferences. Gee, guess who sponsors a lot of these conferences? The drug reps. And who do they hire? I prescribed for many years, in, uh, or my uh, partners did, the medical letter. This was a great periodic that came. Drugs for multiple sclerosis, uh, for another the drug for heart failure. And a testimonial, which is true, medical letter reviews are unbiased. The guidance for treatment and understanding condition being addressed are always clear, concise, and well documented. But I found it to usually be boring. I could read it through in about uh, five minutes because it usually said the same thing. This new drug that they're putting out has only been out for a short amount of time. These are the results. They're not too impressive. They haven't done a lot of studies and hasn't been around for side effects and it costs a lot. Don't be hot going there, doctor. <laughs> Go, you know, almost every drug would be, be like that, which I liked. Well, how's that drug rep PR and information worked out for us? Uh, not too well. The opioid crisis, an American issue. Is it just American? Nope. Look at the United States, consumption of narcotic drugs compared to Canada, Germany, and other countries. The number of people who died from a drug overdose in 2021 was six times what it was in 99. And in 2021, 75% of the drug overdoses, 107,000 people died from that, involved in opioid. That's huge. So there are three waves of the... Uh, opioid overdose and you can see way going back here this is doctors prescriptions okay and they start going up and they are going up and going up from 2000 going up and of course this still keeps going and then you notice this other line oh that's heroin well heroin doesn't start out here and then heroin all of a sudden goes way up and then fentanyl not much and then also fentanyl is going nuts up here so, what is going on? Is there an economic impact? Of course. I never trust these big numbers, but 55 billion a year in healthcare and social costs, people that are uh, addicted to narcotics. 20 billion just in emergency department and inpatient care for opioid poisonings. Well, you ask people, who's responsible for this drug crisis? All these people dying. And I think this is very instructive. Gee, most people think it's the users, those druggies. They want that drug. Oh, doctors, yeah, 19%. Big pharma, eh, 15%. Drug dealers, eh, down there. Distributors, nah. Others, I don't know. Okay. But notice when this is. This is 2017. So that's how people thought this thing was going on. Who's most responsible for the opioid abuse? MDs over prescribing. That's what I think. I think we, the buck stops with us folks. We're the ones that screwed the whole thing up. I was a drug rep. I know how farm companies push the opioids. Whining, dining, it's all about building trust with doctors. And, gee, sometimes there's a little bit of this going on. Dr. Jail made over 6,000 a day pushing opioids. Shows no remorse. Well, he's got 150 years in prison coming up, but he's not bad. U.S. medical group that pushed doctors to prescribe painkillers forced to close. There was a society out there, folks, a long time ago, not that long ago, the American Pain Society. That was our expert on pain, how to treat pain. Well, guess what? They were in the pocket of big pharma, and they got caught in getting all the money because what were their recommendations? Oh, this OxyContin is harmless. You can't get addicted to that. It's just fine, doctors. And the debate on opioid use, why it comes back to us, it says here, as much as 80% of opioid abusers had their prescription for the drug before the start of their addiction. These are not people out there trying to get high. 80% of them got them from a doctor. And we got them hooked on it, and then they had trouble getting off and they had to go to other things and other methods. So I think the onus is on us. 
and the spiraling overdose deaths. And so on this slide, it just shows that this is our prescribing of Oxycontin narcotics and then the bigger one of heroin and then the fentanyl coming up now. Fifth vital sign, how to treat pain contributed to the op uh, opioid epidemic. We were taught the fifth vital sign. You do in the hospital temperature, blood pressure, but you also check for pain, folks. And it was even codified by JACO, the American Hospital Associations, told all the hospitals, you guys better start doing this. You better ask everybody if there's any pain. If they got pain, you give them stuff for it. So this is what came on, was pushed by the American Hospital Association. So the pain society, everybody's telling us. It's not, so we're not all taking money. We're trying to make pain feel, people feel better. We want to decrease pain. But the first rule of medicine is do no harm. But nobody is paying attention to this. So the pain scale. Is Big Pharma to blame for the opioid crisis? Duh. Who's pushing out all this stuff? Purdue and others. I came across these two slides that show it's not an American problem. This is from the Ministry of Health in Malaysia. Pain is the fifth vital sign. So in Malaysia, they bought this bullshit too. And they're getting swamped with it. And I came across this one just a couple days ago. Pain-free hospital. But it's in Kazakhstan. So wait, here's a hospital in Kazakhstan that's bought into this BS about, oh, you cover, treat all your pain. So the big pharmacy web reached a long ways. Most Americans want drug companies held accountable. Peru Frederick. Yes. They're the ones that push us. They're the one that lied. They're the one that did all this for financial. However, the enemy is us, the opioid crisis and the failure of politics. From the Ann Arbor, University of Michigan, Michigan Daily, pharmaceutical companies do not stand alone in their guilt. Government officials who enabled the sale of opioid drugs to skyrocket are equally to blame in the opioid crisis. There was greasing of political things all along the line in this, folks. When it was brought to attention to politicians, it's no, don't bring this up. How about the FDA? The FDA got bought off by politicians and money also. What's the FDA supposed to do? Protect us from prescription drugs. Did they do it? Absolutely not. So where do we stand now? Well, how many fake pills contain a potentially lethal dose of fentanyl? This is pretty scary, folks. Six out of ten. So you just buy something on the street, it's got a good chance, over 50%, it's going to have a little fentanyl in it. If it's a tiny bit, fine, but if it's a little bit more, you may not wake up. Well, let's slide over into politics. Why the foreign policy of fentanyl will benefit the GOP heading into the 2024 election? You know, what? Well... Now, today, who do people say is responsible for the opioid crisis? Oh, it's the Mexican drug cartels. It's their fault. Who? It's the users, you know, just those people that got hooked on it. Chinese suppliers, Mexican government, U.S. government, Chinese government, uh, pharmaceutical companies, politicians, doctors, FDA on here at all. No. Why do people believe this today? Uh... I'll come up later, but social media. Oh, drug trafficking is among the U.S. voters' top foreign policy issues. And this is of right now, folks. So terrorism is up there, but drug trafficking, immigration, upholding democracy, down here, preventing disinformation, down here. <laughs> so that's how the populace feels now. Raising GOP support for U.S. trafficking, unit, unilateral military action in Mexico. So if you see on TV, let's go into Mexico and we're going to take out those cartels. Uh, how's that going to go for you? But that's the stuff that's on social media and TV and whatever. Now, U.S. adults say drug dealers and Mexican cartels bear the blame. I don't have time to go into this, but you, this could be for discussion. This breaks it down into 
registered voters, Democrats, Republicans, independents, and residents of voter states. What do they think? And you see there's quite a bit of variability on here, isn't there? But we don't have time to go into that. So why BS? And where we get our information from, uh, form our opinions and our beliefs, it really matters. And in this opioid, I give it five flies. I mean, this is, this is bad, folks, and it's continuing to go on. All started with BS, so the doctors and, and the public and everybody else. Well, we didn't have a problem at uh, Old Grinnell Family Care because many years ago, we quit seeing drug reps. We caught on to their BS and said, yeah, you have nice dinners and nice lunches, but yeah, we can't in good conscience take any information for what you say seriously. Uh, let's slide over into religion. Throughout history, one's religious beliefs and affiliations often marked one for either complete acceptance within the group or sometimes death. Accepting some of the BS of many religious leaders has often led to hate, war, deaths, and genocide to non-believers. No religion, except possibly Taoism and pure Buddhism, has been exempt. You don't see armies of pure Buddhists or Taoists going around taking over places. However, the most, this is my star, the most egregious acts and policies have usually been made by claimed true believers, fanatics, and religious leaders who have hijacked the religion for their own economic or political power. Believing wholeheartedly this BS often does not go well. Uh, remember 918 in the mass, suicide and murder in, in Guyana at Jonestown in 78. They literally drank the Kool-Aid of Jim Jones. What do you know and feel about the Crusades? Well, I think we all know what they, they are. What were you taught about it? Where did you learn about it? What would you tell your kids or grandchildren if they ask you, well, tell me about the Crusades? What's the Muslim perspective? Oh, they might have a different angle on this. In 2001, former President Bill Clinton delivered a speech at Georgetown, which he discussed the West's response to the recent terrorist attack on September 11. The speech contained a short but significant reference to the Crusades. Mr. Clinton observed that, quote, when the Christian soldiers took Jerusalem in 1099, they proceeded to kill every woman and child who was Muslim on the Temple Mound. He cited the contemporaneous descriptions of the event describing soldiers walking on the Temple Mound with blood up to their knees. This story, Mr. Clinton said emphatically, was still being told today in the Mideast, and we're still paying for it. But nothing is served by distorting the past for our own purposes. Rather, a great many things may be served, but not the truth. It's time to revisit this. Have you ever thought about how do Arabic nations teach the Crusades? Well, in Egypt, students learn about the Crusades in their fifth and eleventh year. In Jordan, in the sixth year. The seventh year in Palestine, they study the Crusades. Eighth in Syria, Lebanon, and Libya. Eighth and eleventh grade in Saudi Arabia. And the eighth and tenth grades in Tunisia. Wouldn't it be interesting to see what they taught in these different countries? What do you know about jihad? Isn't Islamophobia really just another form of dangerous BS? Jihad, a struggle or fight against the enemies of Islam. Quote, he declared a jihad against the infidels. Well, if you want to look further, you find there are three types of jihad. Classified as greater, which involves struggle against one's own base impulses. And lesser jihad, which is further subdivided in jihad of the pen and tug, debate of persuasion, and the jihad of the sword. I got tired hearing a lot of this Islamophobia, so what does the Quran really say? Well, so I got the Quran and I read it, every word of it. No, not in Arabic, what you're supposed to do, but, and found out. So much of the stuff that people say about Islam or stuff is BS. It's not in there. It's just, just ridiculous. 
To what facts about other religions do you believe that may not be true? How much of that is really BS? Is there any hope? Considering what's going on in the Mideast today, the future looks pretty depressing and hopeless. However, a brief look in the past may give some hope. Baghdad, around the 8th century in Baghdad, it was the most learned progressive city in the world. It was a city of peace. Christians, Muslims, Jews all lived together and shared knowledge. So we have had it. This is a book on my to-read list. Ornament of the World, How Muslims, Jews, and Christians Created a Culture of Tolerance in Medieval Spain. So, I mean, this has been done before. Maybe we should go back in history and kind of learn what, what was their secret. I'm a real big fan, as I learned about El Abdul El Kader. And we visited his namesake city in uh, Iowa uh, just a couple weeks ago. And a great book by John Kaiser, if you're interested in this, uh, Commander of the Faithful. It's just incredible, but I don't have time to go into it. Who are the most susceptible to BS? Fat people? <laughs> Children. Think about it. Kids. They don't have any of these learning defense mechanisms we have. The ACE study, probably the most important public health study you never heard, had its origin in an obesity clinic in the streets of San Diego. In 85, the doctor who ran it was mystified because all these people were bailing out of his, his, his obesity plan. And they were, some of them wanted to shed 30 pounds, but some of them were 100 to 600 pounds overweight. So they did the big study to find out what's going on here. Why are they not compliant? Why can't they lose weight? Oh, they're just fat and they're just lazy and they just eat too much. Well, they got all this data. What did they find? They found ACEs. ACEs are traumatic events that occur before a child reaches the age of 18. ACEs include all types of abuse and neglect, such as parental substance abuse, incarceration, and domestic violence. And they found out a linear relation. The more ACEs you had as a kid, the more likely you were to be morbidly obese, not just a few pounds overweight. So they go, wait a minute, maybe this has something to do with it. Well, it does. We survey Americans today and find over 60% of adults have at least one ACE in our childhood experience. What are ACEs? Child abuse, physical neglect, witnessing domestic violence, incarceration of a family member, emotional neglect, substance abuse in the household, criminal behavior, battered mother. So abuse can be, yes, sexual, physical, and psychological. What's so important about it? Gee, they're 10 to 12 times greater risk for IV drug use and suicide. Greater for developing heart disease and cancer if you have ACEs as a kid. Have learning 32 times more having learning disorders. Eight out of ten leading causes of death uh, with exposure to more than four ACEs. And mentally, it leads to, in a lot of these abused people, into racism, poverty, systemic oppression of others, stereotypic threat. Well, we all think, yeah, it's, it's the physical abuse. Yeah, all those kids that were physically abused. And we found out, no, actually the mental abuse can cause more problems. And abuse doesn't have to be nasty to them. Belittling, tearing down self-esteem, withholding affection, being highly critical, and purposely damaging and distorting a person's sense of self are just as important. To be sex... The effects result from psychological and physical emotional feelings of worthlessness, distorted sense of trust, depression, suicide, and anxiety. This is the PET scan of brain of two kids, a normal healthy one on the left, and on the right, a child that was raised in an orphan. Notice part of the brain is like, looks like it's missing. This was not from head abuse or damaging. This was from emotional lack. This person is going to have this brain for the rest of their life. According to a CDC study released earlier this year, just one year of these cases of maltreatment costs about $124 billion over the lifetime of the traumatized child. I don't know how they get that thing, but there's this big financial besides just social costs to these ACEs. So here we go with exactly what's going on on the pyramid. 
And how close do you got? Five more minutes, or you want me to do? I do five more minutes and we'll do break. Is that okay? A ten minute break. Okay, social media, the mother load of all BS. Gee, smartphone addictions. Just some statistics, and hopefully you take a look at these, some of these slides at your own. But number four, gee, one out of five car accidents. Average, uh, two thirds of kids spend four hours a day or more on their smartphones. But some teenagers, nine hours a day. You, many of you in this audience, I don't see too many kids in here, are grandparents. Well, here's a slide you should process and pass on to your other people. Kids who get smartphones earlier become adults with worse mental health. So I didn't realize that kids sometimes got smartphones at six, seven. We know by 10 or junior high, boy, what kid, mom, everybody else has got a smartphone, I get to have one. But look what happens when you, as far as your adapt ability and resilience, your drive and motivation, your cognition. If you give a kid a cell phone here, the cognition is one fourth than it is if they don't get it until they're 18. Why? Because they're not learning how to think. They're just doing, doing this. They're just doing this. Their mood and social disorder. Usage by the numbers, 160 number of times a day. The average American opens their phone daily. Probably not in this audience. Four hours and 10 minutes, average time is spent on them. Number of swipes, 2,617. Oh, why is this girl looking so sad? What's she doing? The slide shows the United States and the UK, how many kids are unhappy. And in the UK, smartphone use. Notice hours a day, farther you up, the worse they are. Social media depression goes up. This is one that I used in, in the office in the last two years. I, mother would bring her daughter in and she'd be depressed or anxious or not doing well, not necessarily suicidal sometimes. And the first question I'd ask them, how many hours do you spend a day on your cell phone? I mean, I, I would do it to make sure they're depressed and find all that out, but that would be lean quick. And then, of course, they said three, four, five, six hours a day. I said, you know, be honest to me. And then I would give them this slide. And I would show them social media use in depression in girls, red, use in boys, blue. There's a difference. Boys get more depressed also after two hours of cell phone use, but girls out of sight. Girls need to be more susceptible to the cell phone use. What about bullying? How would you have reacted as a child if you'd been bullied by social media? You know, I go back and think, and maybe not too well. More data out of uh, the UK, and wherever, whatever you look at it, cell phone use is not doing well. This, I think, is very instructive. People, oh, Paulson's just BSing us. You know, he's putting too much in the cell phone. Well, okay, out here is when kind of smartphones came in, in the gray. So it doesn't feel good to be alive. Okay, some of us feel bad. But boy, did that go up. At what point? <laughs> when you cross into the gray. Rarely meets up with friends. I don't know about you, we, we met up with friends all the time. What happens in 2010? This is not meeting up with your friends. You're not going out. You're not socializing. You're just ho on, on your, your cell phone. And for boys and girls, notice what happens on suicide. And look, this blew me away. This is 10 to 14-year-old boys. Suicide, OK? All of a sudden, smartphone era goes up. Why are boys higher than girls? Boys, when they decide to kill themselves, like men, we tend to do it more complete, not just some cutting. And in England and Wales, 15 to 19, notice what happens in girls also. So I think correlation, a couple more things, and then we'll go to break. How exposure to blue light affects your brain and body. I have people that are oh, in trouble sleeping, doctor. Well, how, what do you do at night before you go to bed? 
I used to read or watch TV, but I've been looking on the news on my phone. Well, it affects your melatonin in your brain, and that can go on and cause you to not get as much sleep, and that can cause neurotoxins and make changes throughout your body. It can lead to obesity and depression, even cancer. And uh, kids, of course, they're up on their phones. They're not getting enough sleep, and they can't get to sleep because they have the blue light. And then we diagnose them with ADHD and then give them drugs for their attention deficit. But the problem is, and over half of them, they don't have ADHD. They got sleep deprivation. And one of the last things, if any of you are interested to look more into this, stolen focus, why all American people around the world, you can't pay attention in how to think again deeply by Johan Hari. Excellent. Okay, so that's a good time for a break because after break, we're going to learn how to deal with others who have stepped in it. Doesn't that sound like fun? We'll take a short break. Listen for the bell. Thank you for returning promptly. Once again, Dr. J.R. Paulson. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Thumbs up. Good. Okay. How to deal with others who have stepped in it. To use an analogy, some may have just stepped, have it on their boots, but others may be just covered in it. So I have to have some pictures here. Some of you recognize this. And uh, my grossest picture of the day that I won't dwell on, Slump Dog Millionaire. This poor kid falls down all the way into the privy. I just went, ugh. There are two ways to be fooled. Another quote for you to memorize. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. Soren Kierkegaard. Andre Gide. Another good quote, believe those who are seeking the truth, doubt those who find it. <laughs> well, somebody's, oh, I know the truth. You know. <laughs> so I'll share the algorithm that I use, just mine personal, when trying to detect BS and how to interact with others who have stepped in it and may still be spreading it. So algorithm, process of set rules, or in problem solving. So it's just kind of a do this, do this, do this. First and most important is to make the distinction between what is said and the motivation of who says it. So if you take one thing out of here, what's the motivation of what they're saying? Don't, don't get caught up in what they're saying. First, look at what's their motivation. Secondly, Inventory yourself for your motivation in dealing with the subject and the other person. I think that's something we, we very often fail to do. What are your motives? Are you really interested in what the other person has to say? Or is your belief or position already solidified? You're not going to convince me to do this other thing. Are you really open for a new perspective or receptive to another person's? Are you in an intellectual silo yourself, political or otherwise? How strong is your position? How and why do you believe what you believe? What cognitive biases do you bring to the table? I'm a big fan of Stephen Covey and highly effective people. Uh, I got sent by the hospital many years ago to go out with Stephen Covey at Sundance, Utah, and, and be able to teach this class to all of the hospital employees about 20 years ago. It was interesting at that time, just what's going on now is uh, in the group of about 15 of us, over half were from UAW and GM and Ford. They were taking this class because in a month they were going to have auto negotiations with a big company. And back then, they didn't go on strike or whatever. So again, it's seeing the other person's side. And it's habit five. Seek first to understand, then be understood. It's so much of the time... Somebody starts, we ask them a question, or they say something, and we're just kind of going, eh, de -de -de. you know, I wish they'd shut up. So I could tell them what the real story is, <laughs> or what my opinion is. I mean, that's human nature, I, but I'm just saying you need to be aware of that. You really need to listen. What are you really saying? Am I understanding you correct? I feed it back to you. What prejudice do you have? And we all have them. What do you assume? You see someone with a Trump flag in their yard. What do you assume when you hear that Trump or Biden said something? What do you assume when you see someone wearing the Star of David or a crucifix around your neck? 
you automatically assume that because someone is a Catholic that they automatically are against birth control, abortion, or women assuming a higher position in the church, or believe everything the Pope says? What do you assume when dealing with someone who is black? Go. Your brain on politics. MRI scans reveal that the differences in brain activity can predict political orientation. So what's going on physiologically in your brain? Now, if we dissect you, no, you don't have an elephant-looking brain, and these people don't have a, uh, that brain, but I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, this information came out this year from Tel Aviv. First of its kind study, Tel Aviv University, found that brain waves of right wing and left wing subjects react differently as they watch campaign ads tailored to a specific political point of view, even in brain regions involving vision and hearing, not just the frontal part in thought. This is the senses. Response in those regions were unique enough to accurately predict the individual's political view. In the first study to show political dependent brain activity, showed sensory and motor area could be said the most basic brain level, rightists and leftists in Israel, literally, and not just metaphorically, don't see and hear the same things. So isn't that interesting? So we can talk about American politics. They did it over there before their last election. Okay, next picture I'm going to show you. Uh, I want to know how many people see, I've done this before in another class, how many of you see the uh, young girl raise your hand? How many of you see the ugly woman? Raise your hand. How many of you see both? Raise your hand. Good, you've seen this before. And some of you that haven't, but again, the first time you do it, it kind of blew your socks off. Because all of us, the first time, we just see one. Because our brain, is just, it just puts a gestalt together, and we see the pretty woman. But then all of a sudden, our brain clicks over and goes, oh, if I look at it this way, I see an ugly old lady. And it's the same image, though. So I'm just trying to make the point, uh, whatever. So I came up with a sunglasses analogy. People on the far right see through red sunglasses. Now, this is Robert Downey Jr., so I'm not picking on him, but I'm just saying if you look at the word, world through red sunglasses, they look different. People on the far left, not just the right, on the left, tend to see things through blue sunglasses. The glasses filter out the opposite color and pass only a selected portion of reality. The strength of the filters I, uh, correlates, in my analogy, to how far from the center the person's political beliefs are. The farther left or the farther right, the denser the filter. True reality is the combination of all the colors or seeing without any glasses on at all. That's one reason I'm an independent. I don't have any filters. Example. My, one of my images of Jupiter, all the belts and the color bands on Jupiter. But this is taken through a red filter, red and green. This is a picture of Jupiter through a blue filter, which is right. When you combine, this is what the real, the real, quote, real Jupiter looks like. You've got all the color bands. That make sense? But this is closer reality and what Jupiter really looks like. In true science, we're not free to pick and choose data or findings. If we do, we need to disclose it. Drug companies in Vioxx, when they came out with Vioxx for arthritis, the drug company said, oh, this is good, helps your arthritis. But they only gave us the data they wanted, the good stuff. They didn't tell about the people who later found out died of heart disease from their drug. They just wanted us to see this. And then, of course, they took her off the market, paid a big fine, but it was just the price of doing business. Don't assume. When I break the word down, it says, ass, you and me. Remember, there are many cognitive biases that we're all subject to, stuffing up your thinking. 24, some people found 50 cognitive biases. What's freaking us out here is that we found a correlation between owning cats and being struck by lightning. Well, I don't know, do I get rid of my cats so I don't, I mean, Florida house selling. My falling for several thinking biases during the housing crisis. We had some land in Florida. We had a house. Uh, for Sean. 
And of course, the prices start going down and Linda says, we ought to sell because it's going down. And I've got a couple of biases. One is the anchoring bias. No, you know, I don't want to admit I'm wrong. And no, you know, let's just hang on to it. It'll be okay. As it went down and down and down and down and down. And finally, we sold it at this thing. So yours truly falls for these things too. If you want to learn more, The Believing Brain by Michael Shermer, excellent. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is intellectual or traits or virtues. Uh, I can't spend too much time with this, but there's things called intellectual integrity, confidence in reason, fair-mindedness, whatever. I really like it when I hear David Brooks on the PBS NewsHour sometimes say, boy, I was 100% wrong on that, or I didn't have any idea of how that will turn out. I'm thinking, ah, intellectual humility. He admitted, I screwed up. I said this, you know, on a previous show. I don't know what's going to happen with the Republicans in this thing. That's called intellectual humility. I like it. Okay, now that we've self-checked, we're ready to address the potential bullshitter. Remember, first address their motivation, because it may save you a lot of time. Do you believe, what do you believe to be their motivation for their claims? Are they just trying to impress you with their bragging, braggadocio, to convince you how smart or great they are? Are they a narcissist or a pathological liar? And we all know some of those. Do they appear to be lazy thinkers and just going on their intuition, like we talked about in the first lecture? Do they seem to have a strong emotional attachment and investment in their beliefs? Do they have any chance of financial gain with you believing their claim? Ah, red flag. Will they gain political or other one-upsmanship in their organization, whether it be a hospital, college, or business? Are they being coerced in any way to say what they are saying? So what I, I like when they do these votes that's going on in, 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 uh, with the, the House, they say, well, if these guys voted, you know, and you ask them what they really, they would, they would say this. But when they vote with their, with their caucus, they have to vote this. But that's not really what they're saying. Motivation two. If they're starting to argue, and they usually will, does it seem to be just emotional or does it have a factual component too? Do they really want a dialogue and are they intellectually and emotionally able or willing to accept the possibility that they could be wrong? Are they willing to take off their filters, sunglasses, or even take a look through yours? You know, if they're not willing to take off those dense red or blue glasses, you're probably not going to get too far. If you're not sure, you can ask them the litmus test question below. And if the answer is no, end of discussion. You'd just be wasting your time and effort. They've just proved that motivation is mainly motivational. Litmus test. If it could be proven without a shadow of a doubt that A, what you're saying is not correct, and B, something different, not necessarily what I'm saying, is correct, would you believe then that B is true? And if they say, nope, I believe that or whatever, that's it. There's no need to continue the discussion. Now that you've determined their motivation and determined that they may be open to change, you can look at what they are claiming to clarify what exactly they are saying and how sure are they of its correctness. So I usually ask, so someone's been talking about vaccinations for COVID, how much do you really believe that? How sure are you what you say is really correct? Very revealing. Remember, we've already eliminated those people who say they're 100% right, <laughs> so they're off. Remember this slide from the last lecture on asking conspiracy theories and other things? You got people who believe it, people who disagree it, and you got a bunch of people in between that are unsure. So continuing a vaccine acceptance. Refuse all, accept all, and everything in between. Sometimes, yeah, I'd accept it, but I'm not sure. My next question is key. Do not ask, why do you believe that? That's the trap that most of us fall into. Why do you believe that? That only leads to what described in lecture one into argument. This leads them to provide theoretical or philosophical arguments or just some more subjective bullshit that you have to deal with. Confusing argument with evidence. Remember, we went over this. Argument is a reason for a claim. Arguments help us understand why something's going on. They don't verify or demonstrate anything. Evidence is looking for proof, confirmation, verification. Examples, it rained because I washed my car. You know. 
Most people are horrible arguers. They usually make major errors in logic and thinking. How many of you ever took a formal course in logic? Raise your hand. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. There are very specific rules for validation of inductive and deductive reasoning. It's much akin to mathematics with symbols and formulas. A person breaking these rules is just like saying three and three is eight. Because if you're breaking some of these, the logic, it's just, it's just the same thing. We don't have time to go into this detail. I'll give a couple examples and suggest the responses to the errors. The courtroom non sequitur and null hypothesis. Ever heard Perry Mason? Ever get up? Incompet irrelevant and immaterial. Yes. Still used today, of course. So, rules of evidence in a court. Very good. Objection, Your Honor. The question is not relevant. Misleading. Calls for hearsay. Well, I heard somebody say that. Nope, that's not in this court. An opinion. Well, that's my opinion. No. If you're going to make an opinion in this court, it's going to be an expert opinion. And we're going to verify the credentials, credentials of the expert. Non sequitur. When the conclusion does not follow from the premises. In more formal reasoning, it can be when what is presented as evidence or reason is irrelevant or adds very little support to the conclusion. Example, guy says, people died of cancer before cigarettes were invented. So smoking doesn't cause cancer. <laughs> uh, excuse me, there's no argument. It's just, it's, yeah. It's a non, non sequitur. What's the null hypothesis? How many people know what the null hypothesis is? Good. You, well, good. A few people do. Definition. The hypothesis under investigation is not true or null until proven otherwise. X does not cause Y. If you think X does cause Y, then the burden of proof is on you to provide convincing evidence or experimental data to reject the null hypothesis. Cats show no preference for food based on shapes. Plant growth is not affected by light color. Age has no effect on musical ability. So two variables, and you can't say anything about that unless the burden of proof is on you. So when someone's trying to argue an invalid argument, if you can recognize them, you can quickly end the discussion. Remember our kids trying to use illogic on us? Your kid's in trouble for doing something he or she is not supposed to be doing. He says, but Dad and Mom, Johnny and Susie did the same thing. Like, his parents, did, I mean, you know, like, Chop them off. Now your response could be irrelevant and immaterial. Or that's a non sequitur, kid. Yes, it's BS too. However, today I hear, I heard it last week, the false argument in political terms. Well, yes, Trump hid and had classified document at his home, but so did Biden. Excuse me? Like that exonerates the bad or illegal behavior of both? You know, just because saying, well, somebody did it on the other side. Now, hypothesis example. I saved a fortune cookie I got many years ago. I had pinned on my bulletin board as an example of a null hypothesis. It says the only thing worse than a real disease is an imaginary one. Eh, think about that. No matter how many tests you do, you cannot convince a person that thinks they have cancer that they don't have cancer. Unfortunately, many doctors fall for this fallacy and continue to do tests or scan after scan, often doing harm and looking for an imaginary illness. You can't prove, you know, well, the test wasn't good enough, or the CAT scan was, I want to get another one at Mayo Clinic, or blah, 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 blah. You just can't. It never ends. So get out of the argument paradigm and get into the evidence-based one as soon as possible. And it's another one that most of you will remember, and you can say, Where's the beef? Remember that commercial? I love it. And you can use that now. That's great. Where's the beef? Ask, how'd you come to that conclusion? What's your evidence for it? How can we check and see if it's true? Has anyone tested that with the experiment? What were the results? How good were the experiments? Were those results verified by other further experiments? What are the credentials of the experimenters? How was the data collected and how big was the sample? Uh, duh, doesn't that sound like the scientific method? Unfortunately, many people either do not learn this in school or fail to adhere to its method. Science matters. So, the scientific method, won't go in detail, but you should know what it is. Question, hypothesize, experiment, observe, record, analyze, share your results. 
Seven ways to identify pseudoscience. Ah, smells like bullshit. Use of psychobabble, words that sound scientific, professional, but they're, they're not. Reliance on anecdotal evidence. Provagen made my, my memory better. Oh, therefore, it's going to make mine. It's good. Extraordinary claim in the absence of extraordinary evidence. I love that one. Claims that cannot be proven false. The null hypothesis I just told you about. Claims that counter established fact. No, we never went to the moon. Absence of adequate peer review. Claims that are repeated despite being refused. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. Yes, but doctors and scientists got blah, blah, blah wrong. I don't trust them. My response, and yours should be, yes, that's great. That's just what science and medicine should do. Boy, does that cut them off quick. Examples of science or scientists... Scientists gone awry. Galileo, Einstein, Hubble's telescope, medicine, Columbus, Darwin. Only a fool of a scientist would dismiss the evidence and report in front of him and substitute his own beliefs in their place. Richard Weeks, who was one of my patients who lived at the Mayflower, gave me this report. Hubble Space Telescope, optical systems failure. <laughs> Didn't do too well when I went up there, folks. Einstein, he's a pretty smart guy. This is a formula uh, in general relativity uh, that has to do with the universe and is the universe expanding, contracting, and Einstein tried to get this equation to balance, and it wouldn't balance. So he put this, he came up with this figure, this Greek letter lambda in there, as a fudge factor to make both of these sides. And later, of course, we proved Einstein was wrong on, the, on this cosmological constant. And then he, he admitted later, he said, it was the biggest mistake in my life I ever made. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little and not those who know much who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. Darwin. Medicine. Aren't you glad that medicine usually, I didn't say always, usually follows scientific principles? If a theory can be shown to be incorrect by evidence and not theory, such as malaria is caused by bad air, it goes on the trash heap of medical history. And later we say, how could anyone have ever believed that? That was so stupid. However, physicians in the medical establishment, I hate to tell you folks, are uh, very slow to change. My experience at the Mayo Clinic in estrogen replacement therapy. I got on that over there for 30 to 40 years, and I go up, and I remember going up and estrogen replacement therapy. Yep, we should put everybody in estrogen replacement therapy and blah, blah, blah for women in menopause. I go out seven years later, and they go, well, a women's health study says... Uh, no, we got this wrong. No, you shouldn't go on any estrogen replacement therapy. And we're going, well, wait a minute, you just told us. Well, okay. But then they showed us the evidence. They didn't just say it. And then I go up 10 years later and they go, you know, both of these things we've done before are wrong. <laughs> you know, it's not all bad. It's not all good. It's okay if you follow these parameters based on this data. So here are the three thing changes. Mayo Clinic within time. That's good. We're hopefully moving forward. Changing recommendations for masking with COVID based on data. You know, when should we start using masks again? Oh, well, hopefully we want to use data. However, when institutions get politicized, bad things can happen. Loss of trust and credibility can be very hard to reestablish. FDA and the opioid epidemic, CDC and COVID, public relations and recommendations. When the CDC got politically taken over, I even didn't necessarily believe what they said. Do you trust your healthcare provider, what they tell you? Are they more believable if they have been your provider for a long time and will spend the necessary time with you to address your concerns and doubts? Isn't the current system going in the opposite direction? So your doctor or provider suggests prescribes a new drug for your elevated cholesterol or diabetes. What should you ask? Well, if you're in this class, you, you might say, well, how many years has that drug been out in general use? What's the absolute risk reduction, not relative, of this drug? What's the number needed to treat? Which is, how many people do you have to treat with this drug to help one person? Is it 50? Is it 150? So you've got to give 150, everybody in this room the drug to help one person? 
I'd like to know that. What's the number needed to harm? How many people do I give this drug before they have a serious harmful effect? Oh, that's only one in 15. Oh, thank you, I need that data. Also ask, what non-pharmacologic lifestyle changes can I make to accomplish our goal? And where did you get asked that, well, I'm not, doctors might take this or, well, personally, where did you get your information about this drug? Oh, it was up for, a, <laughs> uh, embarrassed to discuss it. So, again, just caveat emptor, due diligence. How much evidence is needed for the truth? Very important question to ask the BSer. Often unveil, unveil the real motivations for their beliefs. We all have a different threshold for risk-taking and for what we consider the truth. At what chance of winning will you buy a lottery ticket? What percent of cure will you undergo a nasty chemotherapy for cancer? How many crashes does an airline have to have before you will quit flying on it? What chance of dying will you accept in order to deny COVID vaccinations? One arena innately concerned for the probability of truth is the law. What's the burden of proof in a civil versus a criminal case? What evidence is admissible? How is the jury evaluated? Remember our mentioning of our natural tendency to accept confirmatory evidence and the reluctance to ask disconfirmatory questions, particularly if it goes against what we think or believe? Homework assignment, if you haven't seen it, go back and see the 1957, I think, not 40, 57, 12 Angry Men. I've seen the play here twice. It's great. Or you can see the uh, 97. Again, it completely talks about what we're talking about. They go in, they got this young teen. He's guilty because he's killed this person, and they're all going. But then now they got the jury, but there's one doubter. And we find, well, but, but, but what about this? It's just confirming evidence. And anyway, it's just great. Now, in medicine, we've got a little better. Strength of recommendation or sort. So now, if I read a medical journal and we go, well, what's this based on? Oh, it's sort A. Strength of recommendation, A, B, or C. A says the recommendation is based on consistent and good quality patient-oriented evidence. B, based on inconsistent or limited quality patient evidence. Or C, yeah, it's based on what we used to do, usual practice, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And go into more detail. MMR vaccination and autism. In a study, uh, 1998, Wakefield, uh, British gastroenterologist, submitted a study in The Lancet, highly respected journal. Had 12 autistic kids collected case histories, did blood tests, colonoscopy, spinal fluid. And his findings revealed that eight children had received the MMR vaccination shortly before the developmental delays. Press conference, he speculated that MMR vaccine caused proteins to leak from the intestines and impair neurons in the brain. Later, he did call, say that the vaccine caused uh, autism. Twelve. Investigative reporter Brian Deere did an in-depth look into this. It took many, many, many years to do all this investigation. What did they find? In lieu of the findings, the Lancet retracted his medical article. The findings could not be considered credible with only 12 cases. But that, that's not enough statistic data. They found five of the 12 kids turned out to have case histories of developmental issues prior to getting the vaccination. So you're just taking those five out. Three of the kids didn't actually have autism at all. So wait a minute, you're down to four kids. <laughs> Before the article, Wakefield was funded by the Legal Aid Board, a law firm pro planning to bring a suit against the vaccine manufacturers. Well, he's going to make boku bucks in this suit. In JAMA, let's test it some more. 2015, 95,000 children showed no link. Largest study, Annals of Internal Medicine. 657,000 Danish kids, no link whatsoever, even among those with a higher susceptibility to autism. Wakefield's license to practice was taken away in 2010, having been found guilty of unethical behavior, misconduct, and dishonestly. Yet the BS article had and continues to have, continues to have, its negative effect. Boy, three flies plus. Panic parents on both sides of the Atlantic pushed the children's vaccination rate down drastically. I'm not getting my kid. I don't want them to get autism. Soon the cases of measles, mumps, rubella started to rise, both America and Europe. 
Yet many anti-vaxxers continue to believe and spread this BS, despite what I just showed you, the discrimination. Non-believers, in fact, evidence or science will not be moved by you showing them evidence or reason. What about Galileo? Trial we're all familiar with. Caesar Theramoni, he was a friend and a rival at him, and when Galileo said he saw mountains on the moon and these things, he wouldn't even look through Galileo's telescope. He says, I don't believe you, but I'm not going to look through your telescope. During his trial, Galileo offered the inquisitors, say, just come look through my, my telescope. You know, just use your own eyes. Inquisitor would not. He wrote a letter to Kepler, another astronomer at that time. I wish we would laugh at the remarkable stupidity of the common herd. What do you have to say about the principal philosophers of this academy who are filled with the stubbornness of an asp and do not want to look at either the planets, the moon, or the, or the telescope, even though I have freely and deliberately offered them the opportunity a thousand times? Truly, just as the asp stops its ears, so do these philosophers shut their eyes to the light of truth. Catholic Church, 1981. Uh, they're still getting flack for Galileo. So in March of, 20, of 1981, they set up a commission, the Pope Commission, to look into the Galileo question. So they're gonna have, we're going to have commission, you know, get all these people. Well, what happened? They did it for 10 years. They couldn't come up with anything. You know, so they finally disbanded after 10 years. So the Pope, Paul II, 84, retracted the Inquisition's condemnation of Galileo in 92. We vindicated Galileo and in 2000 issued a formal apology. Now, when someone went back and looked at this whole commission and stuff, they came to several conclusions. This, these are not mine. This is uh, from uh, University of Navarra in Spain. They looked at this. And they said the root error is authoritarianism. They said the error was in judging scientific questions, not in and recognizing that it can't be repeated, and the church cannot admit mistakes. And then they went on to say, science, religion, dialogue is impossible. <laughs> and I put an uh, asterisk by that because I couldn't disagree more. Science and religion do and should work in different arenas. Science can push and shrink the domain where they both overlap. Thor, lightning bolts, Galileo, and other examples come to mind. However, science can never answer the great question an increasing number of should we's. Should we alter the human DNA genome? What trait should we emphasize and which one should we delete? If we can keep you alive with mechanical means, should we? Should we support and make available sexual therapies for LGTB uh, patients? Should we support and fund research for another psoriasis drug at the expense of an antidepressant? Should we send a manned mission to Mars for X trillion dollars or put the money into preventing of ACEs, substance abuse and cancer here on Earth and send robots instead? It's only our great religions and humanistic traditions that can wrestle with these moral questions. So, four things we learned from Galileo. What one sees and what is the truth may be different. It seems that the sun revolves around the earth. Wrong. Everyone in a given society may be wrong. Everybody in your whole society. What members of a culture believe and what is actually the case may be different. When the truth contra contradicts what people believe, they tend to abandon the truth. People tend to refuse to consider evidence if what they might discover contradicts what they believe. More things to think about as we're slowly winding down here. Often asking a clarifying question or more can be enlightening. Does the person think that being an expert in one field makes it believable in another? Linus Pauling, Nobel, Pell, Nobel Prize winner. And vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C prevents a common cold. Nope. Do they believe something is factual because it was said by Dr. Oz, Oprah, on Fox, CNN, or in a TED Talk? No. What do they think is a reliable source you can both trust? Example, interview for a sharpshooter candidate for the police department. You're asked to eva evaluate some people, who, which one of these guys you want to do. And later we're going to talk, wind up with some cognitive dissonance. Okay, so the guy submits, and here's my last shooting thing. And you go, well, that looks pretty good. But then you remember, ah, oh, Paulson talked about the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Oh, what's that? 
when an argument is made and confirmed using the same set of information. So the best example is, it's inspired by a marksman who shoots the side of a barn, then paints the bullseye around the shots. <laughs> Man, I'm a pretty good marksman. Duh. Okay, you take a look at this. I've used this before, but I'm going to use it again. So you look at this and you go, hey, here's one guy who says, here's my sheet. And you go, oh, he got one in the ten, but you know, it's too good. And you look at this one and you go, wow, this guy really got them all in there. But you forgot to ask, what was, what was the person supposed to be aiming at? And they were aiming at f the fourth ring. So who's better? Uh -huh. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is cognitive dissonance. This is why people get upset when their beliefs are challenged. And it's very emotional and a physiologic state, not just a cognitive one. So, look into new information, possibly accept that we've been making poor decisions, or ignore the new information in favor of our bad habits. There's this guy, smoker. So, you either fight or flight. Remember, you've heard that reaction before in our body? The correct is fight. It takes 66 days to get rid of your bad habits, or adapt new ones. Modify your belief. Changing belief is much tougher than our actions, since it's governed by our subconscious. Or, justify our action. Flight. Most of us choose to find that the best excuse is to whitewash our actions. I know smoking kills, but I smoke light cigarettes. AI and bullshit. Unfortunately, AI makes BS much easier to produce. AI can now copy faces and voices, as you know, that can make them almost indistinguishable from the real ones. All the information AI has already gleaned from your smartphone, used for computer surfing, can now be stored and used to send you custom emails, texts, tweets, etc tailored to your individual susceptibilities and weaknesses. These may not even register in your conscious mind, but can be planted in your subconscious. Repetition reinforces and makes it very difficult to remove. However, the greatest threat of AI is not what, that they will develop self-preservation instinct of their own science fiction and wipe out humans, but that they already have the political potential and ability to topple democracies and start wars. Another excellent book I can recommend is Warlike, Weaponization of Social Media by two uh, experts in the field. There's a war out there, old friend, a world war, and it's not about who has the most bullets, it's about who controls the information. What we see and hear, how we work, what we think, it's all about the information. It's back in the 69 movie Sneakers. And this one I got out of the Propaganda Handbook of the Islamic State. Pretty up-to-date. Media weapons can actually be more potent than atomic bombs. Think about that. And bring it to today. Okay. Who bombed the hospital in Gaza? Who has the media control on that? Who's responsible? Pretty big deal. And who do you believe? So bring it right up to today. So, two more, couple quotes and we're done. Carl Sagan, I love him. I worry that pseudoscience and superstition will seem year by year more tempting. The siren song of unreason more sonorous and attractive. Where we have heard it before, whenever our ethic or national prejudices are aroused in times of scarcity, during challenges to our national self-esteem and nerve, when we agonize about our diminished cosmic place and purpose, or when, we fanatic, when fanaticism is bubbling up around us, then habits of thought familiar from ages past reach for the controls. The candle flame glitters or gutters. Its little pool of light trembles. Darkness gathers. The demons begin to stir. However, on a more positive note, Gandhi, many people, especially ignorant people, want to punish you for speaking the truth, for being correct, for being you. Never apologize for being correct or for being years ahead of your time. If you're right and you know it, speak your mind. Even if you are a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. Gandhi. And it's important to call out BS for what it is, sometimes more gently, but sometimes using the bullshit word itself to let the speaker know in uncertain terms exactly what you think. Remember to attack what they say are positive, but not them personally, although they'll probably take it personally. <laughs> 
Even smart people like us can make boner statements and believe untruths. Be humble and demonstrate integrity by often saying, hmm, I don't know the correct answer to that. I'm not sure. I'll have to investigate it. Try to live with cognitive dissonance, even though it's hard. So my three responses you can give to people who have stepped in it or wherever uh, is like, first of all, you can just say, where's the beef? <laughs> you know, they go, oh, what do you mean by that? I go, where's your poof? Not your argument. Where's your poof? Or, like my cat say, sounds like bullshit to me. You know, let's <laughs> do Or if you're really... Yeah, like this one, you say you get out a napkin and you know your table with them for the most intransigent cases. You get a napkin and say, and it's to say, uh, wipe your mouth. There's a little bullshit around your lips. <laughs> so remember to watch where you walk. It's okay for those of you who have your boots on for my BS to take them off now. And I hope the classes have given you something to think about. And thanks for listening. So, fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paulson, for reminding us of the dangers of BS and how important it is to rely on critical thinking and skepticism to avoid believing BS or stepping in it. Next week will be the last bucket course for the fall. We are excited to welcome Dr. Ann Harris, president of Grinnell College, who will present a lecture entitled The Middle Ages Today, how medieval culture continues to move the modern imagination. See you next week. Yes, in the, in the winter, in the spring. Yes. There will be more courses. Yes. <laughs>